Representing Paul Guido, going over DNS and attack surface management. Um, I'd like to say thank you to one of our sponsors, USAA, for making all of this possible. And um, everyone give a great round of applause for Paul Guido. Uh, thank you all very much. And USA is looking for employers, uh, employment out there. So if you're looking for a job or you're looking to change jobs, they've got a big list of jobs available right now. Um, so there you go. <laughs> uh, yeah, own your domain. If not, somebody else is going to do it for you. Uh, I guarantee it. Um, attack service management email in 2024. Uh, a lot of people want to do email like it's 2008 uh, without doing anything else. And that is just like the most horrible way to do that, so we're going to kind of go over the latest stuff there. My name is Paul Guido. Uh, until I was in my early 30s, I was a carpenter at construction. I did all the trades. I grew up in a family that had hobbies like boating and electronics and all kinds of weird stuff. I built Heath kits when I was in junior high and soldered things together. Um, but when I got my hand radio license, immediately I started doing something called packet radio. Uh, basically, I was learning how to do frame tracing at night while I was doing carpentry during the day. Um, finally, I changed jobs. In 1993, I went to work for a small value-added reseller uh, that sold computers and services and stuff in, in uh, that 1993. I became certified almost 20, I'm sorry, 20, 30 years ago uh, in, in this year. Uh, uh, I got my first Novell C&E uh, back then. Uh, I ended up finally get, uh, get five C&Es, uh, Microsoft certification, IBM certifications, uh, and uh, one of the things I'm most proud of is my Compaq certifications because those were very difficult to get at the time. There were only about 2,500 people with that particular Compaq certification that I had. Um, I was hired in 1998 by a financial institution here in San Antonio as part of a Y2K upgrade. Um, there was a lot of concerns about that, but what we did is we created a lab and we ran all our software through it and we found problems, problems that the people did not even realize that they had with their software. Uh, that was Y2K problems. So that was a good thing that we did that. And the, one of the reasons why Y2K was a nothing burger is because a lot of people did a lot of work prior to that. Um, so while I was there, I worked with Active Directory and Novell Directory Services and tying all that stuff together. The storage area network, uh, internet banking, uh, ATMs, uh, you know, I moved the ATMs from SNA protocol to TCP IP, but I didn't just plug them into the network at the branch. Created another network form, created access list form, made sure that they couldn't talk to anything they weren't supposed to, that they couldn't, that nothing could talk to them except what was authorized. By the way, saved all kinds of headaches. Uh, I know of people that have actually gotten ATMs infected with viruses because they didn't do any isolation or any segmentation at all. So, yeah, I, you shake your head. But it happened, Carl. It really did. Um, so, weeks before the pandemic in 2020, I got hired at a local credit union here in San Antonio to uh, work with the operations team. Uh, I have. Uh, security operations, uh, and I do a lot of other stuff with uh, audit and responses to audit, uh, policies, paperwork, planning. I seem to be typing a lot, and I guarantee you, my English teacher from high school is rolling over in his grave uh, because of all the stuff that I didn't learn then that I really have to know now to type and type and type and type. So, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, always learning. That's a big deal. Once again, I was a carpenter, and at night. I did frame tracing. So I learned like Wireshark type stuff for fun. So one of those deals. So initial access brokers are after you, are they? So do you have a website? Uh, do you have customers or members or people that log into that website in any way, shape, or form? Uh, do you have MFA for those users to get into that website, or are you just relying on usernames, passwords, or heaven forbid, the deprecated uh, SMS text? Um, do you have a VPN for you to get into remotely? A lot of people are doing work from home still, and uh, I'm blessed. We can do work from home still with the organization I'm working for at least four days a week. Um, and it looks like that's the way it's going to be forever. 
Uh, no one's even talking about changes. We became more productive. Our least productive day is the day we go in the office. That's the way it is. Do you have Microsoft Azure Intro ID Exchange Online? If you have any of this stuff, I guarantee you, you're getting hacked right now. People are trying to break into those accounts right now. Every single one of those is an attack vector. They're trying to log into the local radio club's website. Website. Why? Because they can use that as a platform to spread malware or other problems. Um, the more that they own those kind of things, the more they do things with. Doesn't matter, right? So the same thing about your user base. They're credential stuffing those accounts as well. But here's the deal. How are you mitigating credential stuffing? What are you doing about it, right? How are you trying to make sure that that's not a problem? Um, it, it, it's a mess. One, do you have fidelity in your logs that you can spot it? That's really key importance. You gotta be able to see what these things are doing and all the failures that the, these logins are providing. Even if you get the logs, if you don't have the people that are checking those logs, building those alerts and putting those controls in place to make sure that they're mitigating the stuff, you're lost. Great, I got a log that says it's happening, but I'm not doing anything to put a control in place to make it stop. So all of this stuff matters. Are you getting logs for everything that anyone can log into and making sure that those logs have some kind of alert to tell you when bad things are happening? So, because if you don't know if bad things are happening, because I guarantee you, the first thing out of the gate isn't them taking a list and doing a bunch of logins and doing a bunch of lockouts on your Active Directory. That happens weeks, months, days later, but it doesn't happen the first day. When later they'll buy that dump for your organization, call out those email addresses and then try and hit something that, that you used as an old password or whatever at some site that got hacked, uh, LinkedIn, whatever, Facebook, whatever. So too many people have shared too many passwords over the years. Once again, all of that needs to be put in place. Grab those logs, put them in the sim, get somebody to create rules and monitor them and do something when something happens. Make sure you secure what I call the big three. You have to secure three things. I'll be talking about them individually, but just right, right off the top of my head. Your domain registrar. If you don't have good control over your domain registrar, you don't own your domain. Your DNS provider, if it's external. If you don't have good control over that, once again, you don't own your domain. The third one is your certificate authority. You have to be able to make sure that your certificate authority only provides certificates on your behalf at your uh, action. You do it, right? That nobody else can do it for you. So how do we do this? A lot of this stuff's gonna be kind of sing-songy at the end, but your registrar holds the key to your company's brand. Lock it down. Um, there should be a very limited number of people that have access to this. Uh, make sure you audit those users. People leave organizations. People that have these kind of rights. Um, when's the last time you checked your domain registrar to see if anybody that's left the organization is still on the list to log in? A lot of these things have been around a long time, and I'm talking about domain, uh, I'm sorry, uh, was it uh, uh, something solutions? Domain solutions? No. Network solutions. Network solutions is one of the oldest domain registrars out there on the internet. And, you know, I know uh, the previous place I used to work, um, we started using them in 1998. I wouldn't be surprised if there's somebody left there since 1998. Uh, I cleaned me up when I left, I guarantee you that. <coughs> Send that logs it, or any kind of change information that you have, once again, to your sim. Create rules out there. If some new user is created, or even if there's a login, it should be tracked, should be ID'd. Um, Another good reason for this, uh, what was it, 2016, the bank in Brazil, some hackers figured out that they could get into the domain registrar of that bank. So what did they do? Nothing. For three months, they built an identical website to that bank. <laughs> and then one day, they went in and switched to their website and everybody logged into that while they were logging into their accounts with the same credentials and moving some money around. So. Yeah, once again, this is really important stuff. <laughs> oh gosh, 
Um, if you've ever had an index record and received email for a domain, you own it for life. And I tried to get this across to multiple different marketing departments and other over the years. The reason you own it for life is because if there was ever an account external to that organization that was used to create an account, you got an email back, you can reset passwords, you can do everything else. You stop using that domain, anything that that domain was used to register on the outside, they own all of that email. Uh, they'd be able to reset passwords, get back into those accounts, act as the organization, and if it's something as bad as your domain register or your DNS or whatever, you're in dire straits. So don't do that. Um, who can log in? Once again, are they still employed? It's the same kind of deal. Multi-factor authentication. Um, one of my favorites is to set up a federated identity, so when they leave the organization, it goes away, with the, like an MFA push. And if the website had its own MFA, I would add that too. Yeah, that's like four factors of authentication, but can you really be tight enough for these kind of things? I really don't think so. Um, because once again, I guarantee you they're after you right now. Um, DNS, once again, I mentioned this is in my overview. DNS, same kind of deal. Uh, lock it down, audit, send those logs off, make sure that if anybody was in that system that they're still with the company. Um, if a park domain does not have an index record, create one. Now this kind of goes against what I said earlier, but I'm not saying create an MX record so you can get email. I'm saying create an MX record so you can set a DMARC record, and that DMARC record says fail. What that does is, if anyone sends email on behalf of parkdomain.com, or whatever it's called, uh, let me think of one, um, justabank.com, or mortgagehuman.com, I don't know, I'll make them up. Um, if you own that domain, create an MX record, and then create a DMARC record that says anything from mortgagehuman.com goes fail. What that does, it's a policy that you set that when those companies, let's say Yahoo, Google, or whatever, get that email from China for the pharmaceuticals or whatever they're trying to do or sell, they're going to take that email, find out that your MX record, I'm sorry, your DMARC record says fail, and drop that email. They'll reject it. Um, actually, it's not, uh, yeah, it's reject. Reject means fail. Sorry, one second. They have started pouring the beer if anybody wants one, the keg's back there. Uh, if they only had a table for it. Uh, if they only had a table for it. So, once again, any domain that's parked gets an MX record to fail. I can't stress that enough. When you do that, you're going to set the, uh, um, there you go, configure DMARC to go to your aggregator. Anybody here use an aggregator or know what an aggregator is for for DMARC records? Cool. You can set in your DNS records a couple of parameters for DMARC. You can set your RUF and RUA parameters in DMARC to go to someone that takes all of that information, aggregates it, puts it in a nice readable format because the forensic records are mm, g-zipped, I believe. The A records are just uh, the audit bare header information. But the RUFs are really handy because they'll tell you everything about the email that you sent. Um, so those go to the aggregator. The aggregator can go ahead and display it to you in a nice consumable format. Aggregators have names like Algari, Mimecast, Proofpoint. Uh, I think theirs is called Email Fraud Defense. They vary in amount of what they provide you and how much they cost. By far, the Cadillac, Mercedes-Benz of it is Algari. But they want crazy money. Okay, Kay. I found this on the web for Cadillac. <laughs> Check it out. I really appreciate that. Have a good day. So, uh, that it's, it's, it's crazy. I've asked for quotes from them a number of times, and I've heard the same insane number for an annual cost, regardless of the size of the organization I work for or ask the question. By the way, yeah, they're owned by Fortra, and Fortra's out there, and I have talked to Fortra about this problem. So, um, 
and I love Fortra. Uh, they have a company called Fish Labs. Awesome. They do takedowns like you would not believe. Big time. Love their takedowns. They do it, the Fish Labs group. But Algari, oh, awful. It's crazy money. So, once again, look at Minecraft, look at Proofpoint, look at somebody else. Audit all your C name records. A C name record inside of DNS says Fred dot just a bank dot com points to something at a marketing company selling campaign 29.com well if that domain that it's pointed to ever gets sold dropped whatever by that marketing company a bad actor can pick it up what will they own they will own Fred dot just another bank.com. They'll own that entire section. At that point, they can get certificates for it from Let's Encrypt. They can do all kinds of other craziness if you don't have other things locked down. So, getting back to that, audit your C name rec records. Are you still using those C names? Um, it's difficult to do, but you have to do it. Any questions about that? Because that's really important to audit your C name records in DNS. That's, that's what you're talking about there is dangling DNS. Do you mean that the DNS record dangling? Dangling? That's the risk. Oh, is that, yeah, yeah. Dangling DNS. Yeah. Uh, so somebody will, once again, if your C name points to a marketing company and the marketing company either goes out of business or quits paying for whatever that domain name is that it points to, then that actor buys that domain and then they own everything that happens of all the places that the C names point from. So, so if you have something bad in your organization that points to the C name, that could be the issue. And, and I hope that helps clears it up some. <coughs> so, last but not least is your certificate authority. And uh, thank you very much, Carl, for the uh, push this morning, uh, the, the bump. Uh, the certificate authority uh, is also one of the big things that you need to be careful with because, once again, they own your domain, your DNS, and everything else. They can own your certificate authority. Um, lock it down. Uh, audit the user's access certificates. Once again, if they're not employed with the company, kill them off. Um, now, this is the part that Carl was talking about earlier today, the CAA record. CAA record is a DNS record that you need to publish. You must publish. Please go out and publish. Write it down right now if you don't have one. And you'll, if you want to find out if you have one, I'll show you in a minute how to find that. What you say in your CAA record is what certificate authority is authorized to provide certificates for your company. So, if it's DigiCert, or what, or, or Let's Encrypt, or whatever, you publish that information in your CAA record. No other certificate authority can provide certificates if you publish that in there. Only what you state. If they happen to uh, issue a certificate for uh, from, what is it, Komodo, or one of these other certificate authorities, and they weren't in the CAA record, they could be in a lot of trouble. They could be actually kicked out of the browsers, which is basically the death nail. That kills their cash cow. And if you are wondering what that looks like, look up the history of verisign.com. Anyone? The <laughs> Carl's laughing. You know what I'm talking about. Verisign used to print money. They printed money and it was easy. And they broke the rules when it came to being a certificate authority, and they were basically kicked out. They were repeatedly told not to do it, and they ignored the, the being told. And they were basically, all the browser manufacturers said, we can't trust you anymore, and killed them off. So create a CAA record for your DNS. Say who is authorized to do that. TLS posture. This is one way we can find out. Unfortunately, I didn't have it where that graphic didn't show up. I'm not that great with PowerPoint. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good with security, though. <clears throat> so this is a report that you get from a place called SSL Labs. What's your external security posture look like for, let's say, your website? Go to SSLLabs.com and do a test your server. Um, uh, I'll, I'll be happy to call people out. Go test USAA. I guarantee you they're spot on. 
Um, not only that, I use them as a reference for how to do things generally. Um, for their TLS 1.3 and 1.2 parameters, they pretty much always rate as an A+. Plus. Um, they have almost everything where this comes up completely green across the board. Um, so check not just your primary website. Check your APIs, check your whatever, check any site that you publish that, that's a 443 and is secured by a TLS certificate, send that over there and have them take a look at it. And if any of them look bad, do something about it. Try and make it better. Um, so one of the things that this is going to tell you is if you have a CAA record. Um, it's going to tell you if you're running a deprecated protocol. It's going to tell you if you're running TLS 1.0 or SSL 2.0 or you're running uh, Diffie-Hellman or uh, SHA-1 or anything else that's deprecated out there. It's going to tattle on you. But the, here's the deal. The bad guys already do this stuff. And if you're not taking care of business on your website, what you're doing is you're telling all of them, hey, come hack me. I don't pay attention to detail. Because this is all easy stuff to do. So get out there and do it. Would you like a free security scan? It, by the way, it's an old chestnut. You get them all the time, you just don't get a report. <laughs> They've been saying that for years, and it is so god true. I mean, uh, I can't tell you how many times I have to you know, endure that we're going to get another scan, and they won't stop, and the, uh, we talk to the, uh, the hosting company that's hosting this stuff. They're not bringing it down. Um, so what do we do? Block them. But yeah, we're getting scans all the time, but we're not getting reports for whoever's scanning us. So if you'd like a scan that you do get a report from, uh, and I got to talk to him. Unfortunately, he's not here right now. He had to take off to go uh, take his kid to a uh, soccer game. The, uh, Darren from C uh, Dis uh, CISA and the Department of Homeland Security was here. CISA will do a scan of your external namespace or IP address space and provide you a report on it on a weekly basis. Uh, free. They do this for free. They use all the standard tools like Nessus and everything else. They put this report together and they'll say, you have X number of sites that are in your class C that are exposed to the internet. Um, we're seeing this many types of protocols that are out there. We're seeing that you have something that's deprecated, either it's TLS or you have something that's vulnerable or has a, a, a problem. If you see, if they see a medium or a high, I believe it is, they will contact you by email every four hours until you get that cleaned up. Um, they want you to be strong. <laughs> CISA wants you to have a good place to um, be on the internet. So, I truly recommend start using their services. They will come in with a red team and hack your internal network for you as well. That is another service they provide. They will do social engineering tests and they will do them the same way for every single organization that they work. So they can kind of rate you in your industry and overall on how well you're doing. Use their services, they're free. So. Uh, that's what I'm thinking about. Yeah, they won't contact you until uh, everything's resolved, especially if it's high. Get control of your email. I, I can't tell you how many times I'm on a phone call with a vendor, um, and they just don't seem to be able to take care of business when, for, when it comes to email. Frankly, I'm happy uh, that Google and Yahoo and everybody else got together and said, no more. Unless you follow DMARC um, protocols and you have your... Um, uh, SPF records and you have your DKIM signatures done, then we'll accept your email. But if you send over 5,000 email a month to us, I'm sorry, a day, 5,000 emails a day to us, um, we'll, we'll just stop receiving your emails at Gmail or Yahoo. That's it. We're not going to play around anymore. You're going to have to follow these protocols. <clears throat> so, that's the deal with that. Why should you set all these particular things up? You should set them up because it's brand protection. Do you care about your brand on the internet? Um, I'll pick on my buddies over at USA. Um, so USA is USA.com. 
I don't even have to look it up. I don't got to Google it or nothing else. It, I just know. They have a pin over there for jobs, usajobs.com. Why dilute your brand? <laughs> Why isn't it jobs.usaa.com? I don't know. Marketing. Try and talk to marketing people about it. It's like talking to the wall sometimes. And I would imagine these conversations happen. But, you know, somebody gets it in their head that they have to spin up a whole other domain for something just because. So, um, and I'm sure these conversations happen. I know I had them at my old job. They just wouldn't listen. They wanted to spin up new domains for everything instead of use a subzone. So, brand protection. If your brand is USA.com, you're going to do your best to protect it. Uh, I know I protect the brand at my organization. And why do you do, or how do you do that? With the files of this DMARC stuff. Man, I really could use a table. Oh, there we go. About nine years ago, I found evidence by these RUA and RUF records. Somebody was using, at the company I was at, our brand to sell pharmaceuticals from China. They were using it for spam campaigns. And the only way to stop them is to make sure that this stuff that I'm going to tell you about is set up. You have DMARC, and DMARC is set to fail. <clears throat> marketing should be demanding. They should be coming to you and demanding that you set up DMARC records. Why? Because it is the best way to assure that the emails they want people's eyeballs on is actually being seen by the people they want to send it to. It's the most reliable way to get the emails out there is if you have DMARC set up and DMARC set up to fail. I can guarantee that the organization I work for receives the email that I send out, that our organization sends out, and that they're not getting it from a pharmaceutical spam campaign on our, our brand out of China. So that's what I was talking about. Google and Yahoo and others have basically said, you do DMARC if you send more than 5,000 emails a day, and if you don't, we're going to just say no. And they have the ability to do so. So how do we set this up? In review or, or in preview, there are three things you have to have. You have to have the source of the email. You have to sign the email. You have to have a, have a policy associated with the email. So how do we do those three things? Those just three things. Sign a source, sign, policy. SPF, that's your source. Basically, it says, where does this email originate from? What is the outside relay? Where is it coming from, right? How do you do that? You create an SPF record. That SPF record could have includes that say uh, a particular domain, but you have to be careful with those, and I'll tell you why in a moment. Or it could have a bunch of IP addresses that have, or IPv6 addresses. Nonetheless, it specifically states where that email is coming from. Um, see, what else do I need to talk about here? I think that's about it for that, really. So, nonetheless, you create on your DNS these SPF records. Let's talk about be on the lookout for. <laughs> SPF is a limit of 10 lookups. If you have more than 10 includes, you have broken what's called the RFC, the rules of how these SPF records are designed to be used. So, how does that happen? Let's say I'm in an organization that has six lookups. Some organization that's a, uh, thoughtless will give me an include that has six more lookups. This thoughtless people will break that 10 rule, right? They add up, they're additive. How can I fix that problem? Use subzones. So, W5SC.org is the San Antonio Radio Club's website. If I wanted to send events out, I could actually send that in the subzone. I could say no reply at events.w5sc.org. Why would I want to do that? Because every single subzone that resets the counter, I could have 10 lookups. And what that does is take pressure off my root domain of W5SC.org where I don't have more than 10 lookups. So, uh, you can go to Radio Fiesta at event.w5sc.org. Oh, by the way, I am a ham radio operator, and uh, we have our big field day event coming up on the uh, 23rd and 24th. 
uh, and uh, it's at the city of Chavano Park. Come on out. Uh, and then in July 19th, we're going to be doing our big uh, radio fiesta. Come on out. We're going to have CPS's trailer there where they're going to be demonstrating why you don't want to touch 6,000 volts. <laughs> Uh, and they do that with a hot dog, and it doesn't take long. Uh, so every vendor, if every vendor has a subdomain, it'd be easy to track um, when there's a problem. I almost said when you're stupid, um, because that's basically what you find out. If somebody makes a mistake and edits a DNS record to break what you have set up, and you have it set up for fail, you're DDoSing your email. If the people that are sending the email on your behalf send it from someplace that's not in your SPF record, or they don't sign it anymore with the same DKIM key and they changed it, or they don't sign it at all, they break DMARC, and, and those emails will not be received. That's why you need some kind of alert from your aggregator when they see excessive failures. So, um, just FYI, this is very exacting stuff. It's got to line up perfectly, or it doesn't go out. So, be on the lookout. That SPF 10 lookup limit is really something that bites you in the butt. Put everybody in their own subzone that sends on your behalf, and your life is going to be so much simpler. Oh, so let's, we'll talk about that in a minute. Oh, God, please, please my beer. Thank you. Uh, so, DKIM. DKIM is the signing part of it. We talked about the source, and let's talk about the sign. <clears throat> so, the message are signed cryptographically. So if the header is modified, it will say, this header has been modified and I will not accept it. Um, that happens sometimes when emails get automatically forwarded. I'm so sorry, don't automatically forward them. Just send them where they need to go, people. Um, and the, I don't have a way to fix that problem. But. What we can do is say, cryptographically sign that email to show that that person is in control of that private key that signed that email. Um, so, what have we done? We've said where the source comes from. We've also published the DKIM key of our public key that's being signed with the private key the email is. So we can validate that that is our email that's being sent out. For the longest time, those are the only two things people cared about. Then they came up with DMARC. DMARC is the policy. What does the receiving organization do when they receive an email that does not follow the, poly the, 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 the DMARC, uh, um, what it said? So if your SPF is off, you don't say the source correctly. If the DKIM is not signed, it's not signed correctly. What does the policy state you need to do? There are three things. You can set it to none, which basically I recommend to do that at first for any domain while you're creating all your aggregator information. That says don't do anything. Don't reject it, but don't throw it into quarantine. Next, you can say throw it, oh, I went too far. Uh, you can throw it into quarantine, which throws it in your spam folder. Last, you can say reject. If you say reject, it's going to throw that email away at the re relay. So if that email goes out to somebody at google.com and it doesn't match and you have it to reject, the relay is going to throw it away. That's just the way it is. So you want to make sure all this stuff works before you cut it loose. Um, once again, aggregator. So. Um, if you have a problem, you can flip it back to none. Send the email out. Try and work out whatever the problem is. Um, I recommend that absolutely. But you don't leave it at none. This is something that CISA, I believe, and the FBI recently put out a warning about. People were creating DMARC policies thinking they were done, but they were set to none. <laughs> and what that does, it lets you monitor things, but it doesn't let you do anything. What you need to do is finish the job set it to reject. All right, discovery. If you know everything that sends email on behalf of your company, you are so lucky. I mean, really lucky. The organization I work for is big, but it's not that big. But even we had problems finding everything that was sending email on our behalf. 
So you use these RUF and RUA DMARC parameters. They say go to Mimecast, go to Proofpoint, go to Algari to say aggregate that information, put it in something that we can digest, and pull that information back out. Once again, aggregator. Aggregators turn data into actions. What do we need to fix to continue moving forward? What do we need to take out of the root domain, put in their subdomain, and keep moving forward? Level one, clean up what you can control. Your primary relay. Everybody knows where the email comes out of that thing. Uh, and other things that you can figure out or find out or things that you know that marketing is doing today. It's hard to figure out what they did 10 years ago that's still in place because those people don't work here anymore. <laughs> but you ha that's where the aggregator comes in. Aggregator, RUA and RUF. Now you can see how deep the rabbit hole goes. And you'll find that one little thing that sends a few hundred emails a month that nobody that the organization knows exists anymore. And by the way, you might not even need. All right. Once again, subzones. Every time you move something to a subzone, you get another reset on your 10 SPF record lookups. So move them as many as you can, plus it's easier to manage them that way as well. Clean up what's not in use, including your C name data. Once again, uh, getting back to C names, they can bite you in the rear. And with things going to Amazon, those C names are just a part of doing business, right? Level five billion. Some strategies for working with vendors that send email on your behalf. Thanks to Google and Yahoo and everybody forcing the organizations to move forward, this is less of a problem. It's still a problem, but it's less of a problem. Because you can throw that at them and say, this is not an option for you to support DCAM and SBF anymore. <clears throat> Let's try and work together. That's a good strategy. I like that strategy. I love that strategy to start off with, but I do like the one where I just grind them down like a, you know, the oyster in the sand to make a pearl. Call them three times a week until they get the right people on the phone or the right programmers to build the right code in their email that they're sending on your behalf. Or go to your organization and say, we need to find people less stupid to send our email. Work around the problem. There is a way for using wildcards and some craziness, that you can have Proofpoint and others host your SPF records and work around the problem. I don't like that because it's not a positive control. Um, it's kind of eh, random. Find, fixing your out of control SPF records, yeah, subdomains again. You've got more than 10 lookups, you got to move them. How many here have heard of BIMI? B-I-M-I? Fantastic. Wow. It's getting more out there. That is fantastic. BIMI is brand, oh, brand indicator for message identification. You've probably seen this, but you don't know exactly what you saw. If you use Gmail in a browser, you would have seen a little bubble that might have an M for MasterCard, let's say, or a V for Visa or whatever. Uh, maybe a U for USAA. Maybe not. Maybe you see USAA's logo instead. Hmm. Why is that logo there? That logo will only show up if you have the proper DMARC information set up. If you're, and you have some extra sauce. You buy a certificate from somebody like DigiCert that is designed, verified mark certificate. You cryptographically sign that image. You put that image in a public place and you define where that image is in your uh, DNS. So what happens? Um, it's being adopted by large brands that place a high value of, on email security and customer trust. So, when I look through my email and Gmail, what brand do you think I see there that, that has a, a, a Bimmy icon? Amazon. Banjo Ben's General Store. <laughs> yep. Banjo Ben has figured out how to do this. Why can't you? <laughs> so, right? <laughs> They've done it. So look at Bimmy and see what you can do to try and reinsure the trust of your brand with your customers, with your members, to show them that you're doing everything you can to do it right.
for email, to do it right for DNS, to do it right for your domain, so you can control what's going on. Keep up with your logs, create controls, create rules, whatever you need to do to keep things going forward. Keep your domain your domain and the company's domain that you deal with and manage. So, anybody have any questions? Yes? What happens, so if you use a, a primary, like a CSP, or you go through them for the domain registration, yeah. and they switch that on the back end like that's happened before? So how does that, like, when they're messing around with that, and they're changing the so, domain registrar? Oh, wow, so you're saying, like, a domain registrar got purchased? Yeah, and then they, like, move it around and things like that? You know? I, I've never really had that problem. I don't know. Um, the domain registrars that I mainly worked with was like, uh, once again, uh, uh, Domain Solutions. Um, and um, the other one I love is Hover. Hover is cheap, and, and they provide privacy right off the bat. Um, that's where I have all my personal stuff in there. They're cheap. I used to use GoDaddy. GoDaddy was costing me three to four times the amount of money that I'm paying for a domain. It's like 16, 17 bucks at, at, at Hover, and, and it's all inclusive, including privacy. One place. Oh, and the more domains you own, the better discount you get anyway. So that's why I own, uh, you know, mortgagehuman.com. <laughs> <laughs> and just another bank.com, just to show people, you know, it's just another bank. Um, any other questions? Um, all of this stuff is easy enough to set up. The hard part is who does it, uh, really? Um, some people throw it over the wall and say, hey, security team, this sounds like security, you do it. This is the way email is built in 2024. If you're Exchange and your email guys don't know how to do this, you need to find other people to do those roles. I'm sorry. sorry. You know, they need to learn. They need to learn new things. This is not something new. DMARC has been around since 2008. It's just time. It's just time, okay? Any other questions any, about any of this stuff? Yes, sir. Yeah, what made you pre-game on the AI human mortgage? Like, that's like a total AI. Uh, well, no, no. Uh, I, I actually, I got it when I did. I, I knew the CISO over at uh, a credit, uh, credit Human. And so I bought MortgageHuman.com as a troll. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> So, so yeah, I own a couple things like that just for fun. I, I own cyberdumb.com because too many things are cyber smart. <laughs> it's just part. Someday I'll do something with it. Who knows? Well, nonetheless, thank you all very much. Enjoy B-Sides. Grab a beer. Have some fun.